So I thought I'd start out by just acknowledging that I didn't grow up in the, in the IP world. Um, I actually grew up in the optical world. Um, and even though I've been working Ethernet and IP for the last, I'd say, 10 years or so, there's a lot smarter people than me on this panel and in this audience when it comes to IP. That said, I believe you know, the background of, of optical and more recently broadband access coupled with IP is going to be very important to, to kind of gauge where IP networks are going in the future. So what I wanted to do today is focus a bit less on, on what we collectively call IP in terms of protocols and services and focus more on where I think um, IP is going as, as, a, as a networking uh, solution. So with that in mind, um, I think there's sort of five key trends, and none of these are going to be particularly a surprise at a, at a high level. Um, starting with, with scale, you know, I don't need to show you guys a graph of, of traffic growing. We've all seen those graphs. It's been growing for the last 20 years. It'll be growing for the next 20 years. The real question is, what are we going to do about that scale? And it's not just about supporting the scale. It's about cost effectively and operationally effectively supporting that growth and scale, and we'll talk about that. Um, from an intelligence perspective, having been at Mobile World Congress, having been at OFC, listening to some of the talks, I even see it in the name now of the, of the conference, AI is a, is a tremendous topic. You know, people ask from time to time, you know, what's different about AI than all the previous hype cycles that we've had over the years? I think the biggest thing to me that's different is AI is happening with or without us as an industry. It, it, it's happening on a, on a more global level outside of the networking industry. It's really up to us to take the best advantage of it. I would also add to the fact that we need to look at AI from two different perspectives. It's what AI can do for the network, but it's also what the network can do for AI. There's a bit of a symbiotic relationship, and I'm going to talk more about AI, um, what, what it can do from the network. The third area is around convergence, um, and we'll talk a lot about convergence, I think, as well over the next few days. We typically talk a lot about IP optical convergence in the context of metro networks or even core networks. How do we get more integration between the IP and optical layers? This isn't our father's IP over DWDM. I get a bit of visceral or emotional about talking about IP over DWDM because in the past, there were a lot of trade-offs that we had to make to support IP over DWDM. You fast forward to today, and those trade-offs are largely gone. We still have considerations we have to deal with, but the idea of supporting IP optical integration is, is real, and I think it's going to extend beyond just what we've historically talked about in terms of metro networks. Sustainability. I think, if I'm honest with myself, a few years ago, I probably would have put this on the chart to be politically correct. Fast forward to today, and I think it's a necessity that we have this on, on, on the chart. It's, it's an important aspect of the network. AI, is, if it's doing anything, it's going to drive more power usage in the network, and we need to be more proactive in, in, in dealing with that as we go forward. And then last but certainly not least is security. I think this is the one thing on the list that there's people working every day to disrupt this. It's the one item on the list, this list that we can't ignore. All these other items we could potentially ignore, and we die, but we die a slow, long death. Here, we could wake up tomorrow and, and, and be dead if we're not pro proactively addressing security on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it's, it's a very critical piece of the puzzle. So if we go through each of these, starting with scale, uh, I think you can divide this into scaling out and scaling in. When I was in the optical world, I always, I always used to look at the IP guys, thinking they must have a nice life, high margins, you know, great businesses, where we were always you know, fighting tooth and nail on the optical side. You know, I switch, switch gears a little bit, and now I'm in the optical or the IP world, and we're, we're having that same fight, particularly on the edge, where cost is becoming more and more of a factor. As, as we try to deal with more and more endpoints, we've got to continue to drive the cost down of those, those edge routers. Um, unfortunately, silicon's not going to get drastically cheaper in the short term, so we need to look at other ways of how we address um, cost savings in the edge, and that includes leveraging, I think, more modern software architectures around containers. You know, we're not... You know, one of the challenges I've always had with IP is there's 100 different ways to do the same thing, and we need to support all of them, and that kind of creates some sort of bloat and, and you know, extra capacity in, in, a, in a router than you, than you may necessarily need all the time. So how do we better optimize that? The other thing I would say is while we've done a fairly good job of keeping up with silicon, I would say kind of in some ways riding the, riding the coattails of the, of the data center drive um, to 51 terabits in the data center and more of 25 terabits in the, in the metro, We've fallen a little bit behind, in my view, on, on the ac access and edge in terms of silicon. We're probably about three generations behind from a silicon perspective at the edge. Certainly, we have silicon, but it's fallen a little bit behind in terms of um, capabilities and, and traction, so some work to do there. On the scale and upside, there's a, there's a number of things here. When we talk about convergence, that's going to drive more and more um, power and thermal challenges. Another you know, jealous thought I had when I was on the optical side is we were always constrained to 
300 millimeters or 600 millimeters deep type um, architectures, whereas the, the routers could always go as deep as they wanted. They'd have mid-planes, they could, they could be very large. When we start talking about conversion IP and optical, if we, if we assume a least common denominator type of philosophy, we gotta figure out how to squeeze all of that back into a maximum 600 millimeters. How do we get the thermal space power to, to work with that? Couple that with some things around um, being able to scale more indefinitely. You know, chassis are great, but chassis are chassis and they can only scale to what the chassis supports. And I think all of these things are leading in the future to more DDC type of architectures, which are a bit more disaggregated and flexible and offer some type of elastic scale and the ability to distribute um, modules and platforms a little bit further throughout the POP and the, and the, and the data center. If we then go to intelligence, um, you know, we talked about this in the last presentation, but I think I was here in 2015 talking about the, uh, this idea of closed loop automation and, and what, what, we're, what we're heading there. We call it the adaptive network. I think Brady called it the uh, self-driving network, but the idea that we can get to a, a network that effectively operates itself is, is sort of the, the holy grail, I guess. Um, I think we're a little ways away from that. I think we're getting to the point where we can address some of this with automation. And, and I'll just make the point that I believe automation is a bit different than, than AI. I think in the, in the hype phase that we're in now, a lot of people are saying automation is, is AI or using automation examples to point to AI. The difference to me um, in particular is that the automation is still governed by human constraints. You know, if then else statements, if I get this event, then I do this and we know what's gonna happen in that sense. Once we get to true AI, those decisions, those if then else statements are actually driven by the machine and, and what happens can ultimately vary based on based on learnings over time and I think you know that's a little bit scary to think about and that's why I think in the near term we're going to need some constraints around how that AI operates but the idea that we're able to to peer with the network get streaming telemetry out of the network train algorithms make decisions and then push that back through an orchestration layer into the network is really the goal that we're trying to get to over the long term If we then go to convergence, so on, on, the, on one side of this chart, I think is the, the, the definition that we all know and that we all talk about, which is the, you know, in the context of Metro and Edge and sometimes even core networks, you know, there's, there's gonna be a lot of discussion around this, I think, over the next few days. So I just wanted to kind of point on two key factors. One, I think is pretty common knowledge, but I think it's still very important, is that, that the, optic, the, the routers have to be built to support the pluggable optics, right? Gray optics are great, but, but they're you know, maximum five, six watts. You start talking about coherent optics, you're getting up to 16, 20, 24 watts. That router has to be built up front to be able to support that kind of power, that kind of thermals, and be able to deal with that. That's an important consideration. The other consideration I, I would add on the, on the convergence side on the metro is, is the software piece. In, in the gray optics world, we stick in a gray optic and it just works. There's nothing magical we have to do. On the coherence side, there's a lot of software that needs to go into this to make sure it operates with the photonic layer, make sure it's getting the right um, information telemetry that can feed up into the higher layers. And ultimately, I think to make this really operational, we need a multi-layer management solution that can bridge that optical and IP solution together to create real <clears throat> visibility between all those layers. Now, on the other side of the chart, I, there's a different idea here, which is converging um, routing with OLT. So in the traditional architecture, we put a, an OLT, we put a router, and we may put a BNG somewhere else. And the, but in the same way that we're able to turn a router into a coherent router by putting a coherent plug into that router, we're now able to <clears throat> turn a router into an OLT by putting a micro OLT plug into that router. And that software architecture that supports the OLT is now embedded in that IP NOS. And now I can get much better integration between um, middle mile, last mile, and effectively turn that router into a coherent router on one side and an OLT on the other side <clears throat> and get much better integration over the long term. On the sustainability side, this may be a bit controversial, but I would say the number one thing we can do is move to more modern te technology. I know as a vendor, we're still shipping equipment that's 15 years old. Um, I know it's difficult. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, operational impacts to moving to newer generation kit, but when you look at next gen silicon, when you look at higher rate optics, when you look at moving to newer technologies like coax to pond, there's tremendous power per bit savings that you get by moving to newer technologies. And I think that's something <clears throat> we need to continue to push um, across the network. Other areas that I think we look at going forward, I, I call it sleep mode, but similar to what we're trying to do in the in the radio networks is better utilize the silicon and the hardware that's on the cards and not use them. It's like going into your house and turning every light on 
I'm only sitting in one room. I should only turn the power on in the room I'm using. And then liquid cooling solutions is something we've been working on for a few years, both from a chassis perspective, but also from a pluggable perspective. How do we, the number one issue with power, I think, in a router is really heat and, and, and thermals. And if we can cool that more effectively, we can drive the overall power down. Security, there's a lot of different areas here in security. These are sort of the four that, that jump to me. I mean, quantum computing, ironically, I think is driving the need for quantum key distribution. In other words, as quantum computing ramps up, AI gets more intelligent, there's more um, possibility that people can crack into the key distribution algorithm. So how do we, how do we le leverage quantum key distribution to, to, to basically address that issue of, of the weak link in the crypt cryptology, which is the, the, the key distribution? Now, generative AI, you know, how do, we, how do we use AI technology to, to, to look at uh, security issues before they happen and, 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 and highlight that to, to our operators? One of my pet peeves personally is around global regulations. I think they're great, but the fact that every government is doing it differently is creating, creating challenges, and then you have to go and get certified in each, each, each region. It'd be nice if we could get some commonality across all of the different uh, security requirements. And then last but not least, sort of borrowing from, from the IT world, this idea of secure by default. In other words, today we typically power up and we have to provision enable specific security functions. The other way of thinking about it is everything just defaults to on, therefore we're starting from a secure state. And if we decide we want to turn it off, we can, but at least you're, you're starting from a, a known good state. So in summary, you know, we, we've, we've kind of gone through what I think are some of the five key trends. I, I, I don't think all of these are mutually exclusive. In fact, I don't think any of these are mutually exclusive. I think they're all, they reinforce and enhance each other. And if I were to kind of leave with one thing, I would say, you know, IP's here to stay. It's been here for the last 40 years. It'll be here for the next 40 years. And it'd be nice if we could get some more commonality and consistency across all the implementations. But I think, you know, the, the future is certainly bright. Thank you. <laughs>